Okay, it's good to see each and every one of you here tonight. I have a book that I've written, The Way of Wisdom for Diabetes. I want to stress the way of wisdom for diabetes. There are a lot of books that you can get about diabetes management. And most of them that I have, I've got lots of them. Most of them are dry, boring, stale. Most of them are, okay? And then there are even some books about the history of diabetes. There's no application to you in your life in that. And then there are a couple of books that try to bring God into the picture when it comes to diabetes management. One of the best books to bring God in the picture is the Proverbs. That little statement, my son, pay attention to what I say, listen closer to my words, and I'll let them out of your sight, keep them within your heart, for they are life to those who find them, and health to a man's whole body. That word health is what it means. And so there are so many facets and aspects to helping a person with their health and well-being from the book of Proverbs. I thought it needed to be written. And so there are, there are Proverbs throughout this book and applications that you'll find there. And so, as I mentioned, there's, there's some, just a couple of books out there, weak attempts to bring God into the picture. But when you read this book, you will see that God really cares about you directly through His wisdom. He does. And now, I wanted to mention that this book is available to you tonight for a measly sum of $5. $5. I meant to say 10 But then I was going to say 5 If you want to get one for a friend, the second one is just $5. Okay? And I just want you to share. I want you to go away with, with one of these and get all the benefits that you'll find in reading about the way of wisdom. You could say for health and wellness but we're really focusing on diabetes here, but it could apply to about anyone uh, in their life. So, now let's get started. Whenever you think about diabetes, it's been likened to someone who is, you know, really required to play the piano with one hand while they juggle with the other hand, all along while they're walking on a tightrope and hopefully with dexterity. And so why would I say that? Why is there this big balancing act? Well, there's a balancing act because we want to keep our blood sugars as nor close to normal as possible. And in order to do that, there is a balancing act that takes place. You'll have to eat the right amount of food, the right amount of carbohydrates, and have movement along with that, along with, especially with insulin, the right amount of insulin with that, and also other medications, you need to check your blood sugars several times. Now, how many times a day should you do that? Do it as many times to get your blood sugars in the normal range as you can, whatever, however many times that is. And then another thing is we need to keep vigilant because we can get colds, we can get, you know, interactions with others can bring about stress and it can bring an elevation in blood sugars. And so you need to be vigil about those things, vigilant about it. And there's never a vacation from diabetes. Now, I went to a uh, hospital one occasion, talked to a certified diabetes educator. She was the one who kind of uh, coordinated the, the support group, the diabetes support group at that hospital. And I found out that they dismissed for the summer, for three months for the summer. And I was saying, oh boy, I get to have a vacation from diabetes? You never get a vacation from diabetes. I said, okay, I'll facilitate the sessions in the summer if you want to dismiss yourselves from it. And so sure enough, they let me facilitate them and people came, just like they would the rest of the year. People were still coming because they needed to. And so when we think about all the obstacles that are there, sometimes it's too hard to say no. No to what? Well, all those delicious meals, you know, foods that you see in front of you, it's hard to say no to them, isn't it? It takes too much time and effort. Too much time and effort to do what? What, to check your blood sugars? To uh, keep a record of the food that you're uh, eating? 
Well, my friends and their family, they, they aren't active. Well, you're not going to get any support from them, are you? So these are obstacles that we're thinking about in all of this. Now, talk about an obstacle. I'm talking about, it's hard to say no. What is that? Huh? What's that called? Good? Good? Delicious? Someone, does anyone know the, the uh, specific name of it? Apple, Apple crumb. crumb pie? Is that? I mean, I don't have a clue. I don't eat that stuff. Good. You know. <laughs> but that is, it looks enticing, doesn't it? Now, another obstacle that we find sometimes is just other people. You can see, don't worry about your dietitian finding out, Allison, what happens in Baskin-Robbins stays in Baskin-Robbins. Well, you know, to cheat on your, your diet, whatever your, your meal plan, it's not going to affect your friend, is it? Cheating doesn't affect your friend, doesn't affect your doctor, doesn't affect a nurse or dietitian or anyone else. The one that it hurts is you. And sometimes when you're starting to make progress, when things are going better, you have some people that are a little bit upset. They don't really like it. You make them feel uncomfortable when you do that. And so what happens? Well, they want to kind of get you to stop doing so well because you're making them feel so guilty. And I call them basement people. I like to be around balcony people where they'll lift you up into the balcony. They'll encourage you and help you. Those are the kind of people to be around. And so when we think about this, we're going to look at a contrast, as we did last week, between here's what someone says and here is what God's wisdom says, and then try to make an application from that. Sometimes I have food cravings for chocolate candy bars, one guy in our support group said. And then he said, but I just take those little ones. I said, whew, boy, I'm glad it was the little ones, but I didn't ask how many of the little ones do you eat at one time. Now, I, I do admit that occasionally I get one of those little dark chocolate, I mean little ones, they're 35 calories, five grams of carbohydrate, and I take a little, little nibble off of that and just let it melt in my mouth, which is okay, but just occasionally have something like that. Well, what we need is self-control. Like a city whose walls are broken through is a person who lacks self-control. And really, whenever you think about that, that was the defense mechanism of ancient cities. This is actually a city, partially in France, that was built during the Roman Empire. And the walls were there as a defense mechanism for people. And so the proverb says, like a city whose walls are broken through is a person who lacks self-control. If you have the self-control, the walls will not be broken through. And so we need self-control. And all of these other principles and all of this, this, this wonderful, uplifting message from God will help us to develop more of that self-control. Now, I heard about these uh, in the middle school, these uh, young ladies, they were starting to use um, lipstick. And they would go into the ladies' room and they would apply the lipstick and then they would, you know, press their lips against the mirror. And it was becoming a real hassle for the custodian to clean those mirrors. And so what happened was he made a decision to call these older girls into this large ladies' restroom to show them all the trouble it took for the custodian to clean those mirrors because of what they were doing. And so there they were. And he said, go ahead and show them how you clean those mirrors. And so he went over and got this... Uh, this uh, mop and he took the mop over to the stool put it in the school squeezed it out went over and cleaned off <laughs> the mirror and all of them were saying how disgusting you <laughs> well whenever you think about it, I mean there's different ways to be motivated one of them is out of desperation I had one lady that came to a, a uh, seminar once she was in her 20s and she could not even stand. Her feet were burning so much. She had neuropathy, I mean painful. She was on high doses of neurotin, and it hurt her terribly. 
Well, I don't want anyone to have any complications. I want us to do all that we can to prevent having complications. And self-control is going to help us to do that. And so the different ways that we can develop those self-control is definitely with God's wisdom. And I used that last week talking about how, do, how did that turtle get to the top of that fence post? And we talked about someone helped put it there. That's how it got there. And that's what I've had all through my life. People helping me. And usually they're using God's principles, His wisdom, and a lot of them don't even know it. But I want to acknowledge God in this about the principles that are being used for management of a chronic disease like diabetes. Use all the resources you can. Use your doctor. If you need to, a dietitian, a diabetes educator, and, and each other, and good books to read that will be beneficial and helpful. And so the way of wisdom says, my son, pay attention to what I say. Listen closely to my words. Do not let them out of your sight. Keep them within your heart for their life to those who find them and health to a man's whole body. Health to a man's whole body. And again, like I said, you can see these different examples. A person goes to the doctor, hurts when I do that. They say, well, don't do that. Well, God is telling you don't do certain things, and He's telling you to do certain things as well. So there is benefits, number one, for losing weight. 85% of the people who are diagnosed with diabetes, and we're talking about mainly type 2 diabetes, are overweight. And there are benefits to losing weight. You can eliminate or even reduce certain medications and cut down or even eliminate the insulin by just losing weight. By just losing 10 to 20 pounds for most people, it can make a big difference. But when it comes to looking at ourselves and being honest, that's how we have to be. We need to be honest. This guy is calling and thinks he needs a second opinion. Does he really need a second opinion? Does he? Is he really being honest with himself? Several years ago, like about seven years ago, I lost 16 pounds. Would you be willing to come up here? And I just want you to pick up this, take this ball, this bowling, it's a, six, a 13 pound bowling ball. And let's have everyone stand up. And we're just going to hand that around. You don't have to carry it to each one. We'll, we'll pass it around unless you want to. But anyway, I lost 16 pounds. That's 13 pounds. Now, of course, when you lose the weight, it's not as concentrated as it is in a, in a bowling ball. But can you imagine just losing that amount of weight that you're lugging around with you and what difference that would make for you? It would really make a difference, wouldn't it? But anyway, there's all kinds of barriers when it comes to exercise, too. Friends and family, they aren't active. How would I look exercising? I want to tell you right now, you would look beautiful. You would look absolutely gorgeous if you would exercise. Don't have that fear. I don't get enough sleep as is. Well, my free times during the day are too short, even during the lunch break. My expectations, you know, I need to, to do about five miles a day. I, I just don't... I'm too busy to do that, though. So there's all kinds of barriers that we find to it. Now, I heard about this story about after World War II that there was, it was in London, and this general and his young lieutenant, they got on a, a train, and it was like you're at a restaurant booth, you know, across from you, there, there sat a, a grandmother and her beautiful granddaughter. And as they went through a tunnel, it became pitch dark for about 10 seconds. And everyone could hear during that time two things, a kiss and a slap. And that grandmother thought the audacity of that young lieutenant to be kissing my, my granddaughter like that. But at least she had the nerve to slap him back. And then the, the young lady, she, they were having a conversation. She kind of liked him, you know, and, and she didn't, I guess she didn't mind that little quick kiss but she was embarrassed that her grandmother slapped him. <laughs> and the general was thinking, oh, there, there goes my lieutenant. Oh, boy. 
but why did she have to slap me? <laughs> the lieutenant was the only one that knew exactly what happened. He saw that pitch dark time period as a great opportunity to kiss the beautiful granddaughter and slap his general. Now, I don't know what you were... <laughs> I don't know what you were thinking as I was going through that. Every assumption seemed to be correct, didn't it? And you kind of just flowed into those assumptions. They were all correct. And a lot of people, they get the assumption when it comes to exercise. Well, we're going to put some words with that. A workout, calisthenics, aerobics, exertion, running, jogging. I want to give you another word to use. Movement. Let's try movement and see how that is. Now... Someone says, I'm too busy, my free time's too short. And God's wisdom says, well, go to the ant, consider its ways, and be wise. Go to the ant, you slugger, consider its ways, and be wise. It has no commander, no overseer, or ruler. Yet it stores its provisions in summer and gathers its food at harvest. And when we think about ants, what are the characteristics of ants? They're busy. Industrious, always moving, okay. They have what? A waste. Oh, <laughs> some of, yeah, yeah. But, but they're on the move. Anyway, they're initiative, persistent. Hey, there's an obstacle in the way, they'll go over it, around it, or whatever it might be. They're industrious, moving, storing. And so, hey, go to the ant, consider its ways, and be wise. Well, one of the ways to be wise is to move. That can make a difference. Well, I'm too busy. My free time's too short. Well, what about 3,500? 3,500? What does that have to do with anything? Well, it takes 3,500 calories to equal one pound. One measly pound. And you know, you can mindlessly gain weight. You can mindlessly lose it. You could, and you can see that in the middle there, 100 calories less each day. Or 100 calories more each day? What if it's just 10 calories more each day? Three jelly beans. You could gain one pound in one year if you don't utilize those 10 calories each day. And what if you did that for 20 years? Then you would have gained 20 pounds. See how gradual and slow it is and how it builds up and accumulates? 3,500 calories equals one pound. Now that man who wrote that book, Mindless Eating, he had a, a colleague, her name was Cindy, and this colleague took a different job. She did, he didn't see her for a couple of years, and the next time that he saw her, she had lost 20 pounds. And he asked her, well, how in the world did you do that? And she said, well, I decided to get off caffeine. I just stopped drinking that coffee. He thought, that, that's really, that, is that the answer? Well, it is if you're going to Starbucks and getting the latte and all that stuff. But that's not what she's talking about. And then she said, well, he said, is that all the rest? He said, well, I stopped drinking that one can of pop a day, 140 calories. That comes to about 28 pounds. You know, she lost, or, or 14 pounds a year. I don't know what the arithmetic is here. She lost 20 pounds, though. And it was all because she just stopped drinking that can of Coke or whatever it was that was sugared, you know, 100, about 140 calories. And so one gene, she says, I have 40 pounds to lose. I've tried every diet there is. I am not going to waste my time on all this small stuff. Well, it's not really that dangerous to do little things, even for a mountain climber like that, when they know what they're doing, just to do little things. And we can do little things that can really make a difference. The way of wisdom, those who are patient have great understanding. And another aspect of this, he who gathers money little by little makes it grow. So we have the power that is of the small and being patient. But when you look at our age, it's a microwave age. Instant results, mindset. The shortest period in American history I've heard is when you are sitting at a stoplight, and it's the time between when the light turns green and you hear the first horn honk. <laughs> hey, have you ever sat there and you just hesitate just a second 
Someone behind you is going to let you know that a second has elapsed, the one thing. Well, that's how it is a lot of times. You know, inch by inch, life's a sense, yard by yard is very hard. But what people want is they want instant results. So they get on these starvation diets. We're just going to eat uh, grapefruit or whatever it is for a while and something else and try to really cut back. Is that the best approach? Well, how does that involve, you know, the patient person has great understanding? That doesn't sound like it. That doesn't sound like God's wisdom to me. It's not what you weigh anyway, but where you weigh. There was a study done of 464 women, overweight, way overweight. And they were to walk 10 minutes a day that six-month study, they lost two inches around the waist. And some of them didn't even lose any weight, but they lost two inches around the waist. Well, what's so, what's so important about that? Well, there's something called visceral abdominal fat, and that is around the waistline, around the organs there, and there's some results of that kind of fat. The fat increases insulin resistance, glucose intolerance, lowers HDL cholesterol, the good cholesterol, elevates triglycerides, and contributes to hypertension. And so if you could lose some of that, look what would happen. It could really make a difference. And what's the best way to do it? Caloric restriction or movement? Well, I'm not saying don't do one or the other. But where do you get the most benefit? It's in the movement. Moving more. As you watch your meal plan also. But make sure you're moving also. And so there was a woman named Mona. She's 54 years old. She had had diabetes for 15 years. She was on two kinds of insulin. She, was, she weighed 350 pounds. Her bedroom was upstairs. She hadn't been up to her bedroom for a year. And she was just living in her kitchen in her living room. The only time that she would go out is when she went to a doctor's appointment. She started reading about some uh, articles and magazines about walking. And she knew that she needed to walk about five miles a day. But... She couldn't do it. She knew. And so what she decided she was going to do, she went and talked to her doctor about this. She's just going to walk down to the mailbox, stop, sit down, catch her breath, walk back to the house. That's how she was going to start. And for some strange reason, this doctor said, well, that would be physically, physically, logically silly. It's not going to bring about any real benefits. Now, I don't know really why he said that. But here's what she did. She went ahead and did it. And she went to a counselor about this. And when she first went in to see the counselor, the only kind of seats that he had, chairs he had were those arm, with armchairs, you know. And she couldn't even sit down. She was so embarrassed that she ran out of the office. She didn't come back for several months. But when she did come back, she told him what had happened. And he encouraged her to go ahead and walk to the mailbox. She did. And then she eventually went to the corner and eventually went around the block and by the end of one year, she was walking that three to five miles. But it was a gradual thing that she was doing. Now, we had one guy in our diabetes support group in Noble. His name was Raymond. Well, Raymond, Raymond had to move. But he was a vital part of our support group. And when he came, when I saw him, he was on two different kinds of insulin. He was still a big man at 280 pounds. But he had lost... 180 pounds. And before he left, he gave me his uh, pants that he wore when he was 460 pounds. He wanted me to have these. And he took the same approach as Mona did, just a little bit in the morning, a little bit in the night. In three years, he had lost all that weight. It was patience and persistence. And this was Raymond. Can we see that? Am I out of it, Mike? Can we see that? <coughs> see that? That was Raymond's pants, but he lost all that weight in a three-year period. Patience and little by little approach makes the difference. And here's what Raymond looked like when I saw him. And those were the pair of pants, the same pair that I just showed you. And... Uh, he was really making good progress. I, I really hated to see him have to move. But, you know, where, where you see kids, they fidget and they, they won't sit still. And, 
Now, it's a good idea to move every 30 minutes or so. This is not a fidget more story. It's a get off your bottom and move story, says Dr. James Levine from the Mayo Clinic. He wrote a book that I'm going to show you here in just a second and did a study about this idea of moving. And he said, really, what, what the disease, the major disease in America is, it's called sitting disease. There's just too much of that. And there's not enough moving taking place. And so someone says, well, I'm so tired, I don't know how I could be more active each day. There was a study done at the University of Georgia, and I think they're called the Georgia Bulldogs, aren't they? <laughs> but they did this study there. 36 people who were inactive, who had persistent fatigue, and they divided them into three groups. One was going to be a moderate intensity group, another a walking leisurely group, and the other was just the, the uh, conditional group there, and they were no activity for them. They wanted to see what the end result would be, and the moderate intensity was just walking three times a week for 20 minutes, and it was like going up a hill. The other was just walking leisurely three times a week, 20 minutes each time. And what was the end result of all of this? Here was the result. After six weeks, the low-intensity exercise group re reported a 65% drop in the feelings of fatigue. Those who were more intense about it, and I'm not saying that, that you shouldn't walk at, at a, a quick pace part of the time, but other time, walk leisurely. Just use a combination of both. But they dropped those feelings by 49%. And what about the people who, who weren't walking? Did they drop any? <laughs> of course not. So, you know, you, sometimes you go to these buffets, all you can eat. And some people go in there and they can just pig out and not gain an ounce. And other people, they just go in, they just look at the food and they're starting to pop the buttons on the shirt, aren't they? Have you ever heard of people like that? But anyway, the guy's getting that. I don't know what that is. Is that spaghetti at, at the front? What, what is that one right there? Can you, you think, you think that's spaghetti? Okay. Well, we're going we're gonna to talk about that just a little bit later about different kinds of foods. But that study that Dr. Levine did at the Mayo Clinic had to do for eight weeks, and they took an extra 1,000 calories per day. And they, boy, this was an intense study that they did at the Mayo Clinic. An extra 56,000 calories. And remember, we take 3,500 calories equals one pound. That would be that they should gain around 16 pounds. Well, guess what? One guy that he called Ethan barely <coughs> gained an ounce. Another lady gained 14 pounds. Another, you know, everyone else was in between those two there. And so the question is, how did Ethan do it? Now, he was not, you weren't allowed to go out and start doing a marathon at night. You couldn't get on an exercise program. These were sedentary people. They, they, were, they had that sitting disease, and they weren't moving much. And they, those were the people in the study. Now, Ethan, what he did, instead of driving his son to the bus stop, he started walking him there. Instead of just sitting on the, the bleacher at the soccer game that he might have gone to. He went up and down the, you know, the sidelines there. He got all excited about it. And I don't even think he was thinking about this, but during this study, that's what he was doing. In fact, his wife said that he would get up in the middle of the night, just kind of rearrange the, the drapes, or if the window was open, he would shut it. He would just get up and move around and then go back to bed. And, and, and like he didn't even remember doing that. He was up doing those things. And so the end result of this, the difference is that those who gained weight, they just sat two and a half hours more per day than those who didn't gain as much. Now remember, they were not on a programmed exercise movement uh, regiment. They were not. It's just a matter of getting up and moving more. So those who didn't gain weight in this Mayo overfeeding study responded spontaneously by moving more. That was it, just moving more. And here is how Dr. Levine explains that movement helps. There's an enzyme that breaks down fat molecules in the blood. And these enzymes start to switch off when you sit for a few hours. And so a good way to, to break that is just to get up and move, 
take them out of the hibernation mode. And so, you know, I used to look at that and think, yeah, that's kind of funny. Ed is in a, you know, study in, in involving diabetes and lack of exercise. This is the remote control group. Is there anything that they're doing right? They're yeah, they're standing. You saw that. And, of course, that, that probably doesn't hurt either, just to, you know, do something like that. Hold that out there like that. But they were standing, not sitting. How do you use your time and your energy? Watching TV? Sitting and eating? Eating out? Eating takeout? Taking the stairs or the elevator? When I go to a hospital now, Mike, I always take the stairs, the stairwell. And sometimes you got to go quite a ways to get up there, and then, then I walk back down. It's called CD walking down instead of the elevator. Have you ever tried that, doctor? Did take the... But anyway, when you think about this, parking your car, where do you park your car? You're going to Walmart or some place. You're parking it as close to the entrance as you can? Or are you parking it out there in the corner where all the new cars are parked that don't want to get banged, you know? Mowing the lawn. I remember we had two lots, and I, had, I didn't even have a self-propelled mower. It was a 21-inch, and I went back and forth, back and forth, and this two lots, mowing. And I had a neighbor living in a duplex, small lawn, and as I'm mowing, going back and forth, he got out on his riding lawnmower and just, you know, finished his lawn just like that. And it was just a little tiny thing, and he was on a riding lawnmower. It just looked silly to me. But maybe he thought I'd look silly too, just going back and forth, back and forth. But who was being helped the most? I was. Standing more, walking, all of those are beneficial. There was a study done at the University of Tennessee a few years ago of 98 Amish men and women, the Old Order Amish. This was in Canada that they did this research. They were able to get those people to put on a pedometer to put on a pedometer. They wanted to find out how many steps they would take in a normal day. Not in a program, you know, regimented exercise program, because they didn't do that. They were like 150 years ago how people would live back then. And so what were the average number of steps per day? How many do you think the men took per day? Anyone want to take a guess? 20,000. 20,000? It's a little high. That's too low. 18's close. It was almost it, a little over 18, and the women were a little over 14,000 steps. They also did some strenuous activity part of the time. Not just moving, but strenuous activity. They ate generous servings of what kinds of foods, do you think? Bacon, eggs, and apple pie, for example. But they were always moving. And you know when it comes to obesity, the general population is about a 20 to 25 percent. Guess what it was among them? Huh? You read the study, didn't you? It was 4 percent. 4 percent. So anyway, when you think about this and you think about all hard work brings a profit, that's what... That's what uh, Solomon says in, in Proverbs 14, 23, all hard work brings a profit. And when we look at that, think, well, the only, way he, the only thing he's talking about there is financially. Well, that could benefit, you know, all, all hard work does that. But it could benefit you physically also. All hard work. What kind of work do people, most people do today? Most of us, office type stuff, sitting behind a computer, that's... Of course, that's me, but a, there's not real hard manual labor done among a major portion of the population today. Now, you look at that, there's a, there's a proverb in Proverbs 24. I went past the field of the sluggard, past the vineyard of the man who likes judgment. Thorns had come up everywhere. The ground was covered with weeds and stone wall was in ruins. I applied my heart to what I observed and learned a lesson from what I saw. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come on you like a bandit, and scarcity like an armed man. But the idea is, what would they do? They would be out working. Hey, do any of you have a garden? That's good. Work in that garden. Get out and move in the garden. If you have a lawn, use that. Push more and more. 
and get out there and you can move that way and it'll be beneficial to you. Now, there was some study done in Australia about blood glucose levels. They, they tend to, to spike during periods of inactivity and this was done among office workers. And so the idea was that, that they wanted to check this about blood sugar levels with people with diabetes and they found that if they would take a break about every 20 minutes, get up and move around, then that reduced the blood sugar averages by about 30%. What a difference. That's just getting up and move. And so Ted Mitchell, a doctor down at the Cooper Clinic, the Dr. Kenneth Cooper uh, Clinic in, in Dallas, he worked down there and... Uh, he said that he, he thought he moved a lot until he got a pedometer. He had been, you know, up from one room to another, checking on patients and this and that at the clinic. And it wasn't until he wore that step counter, that pedometer, that he fit around, found out how sedentary his work really was. Because after four hours of work by noon, he checked it and it had 500 steps on it. He said, it took the step counter to open my eyes to the decept deceptively sedentary nature of my work. A cardiologist wanted to check her patients to find out how many steps they did. Just do what you normally do. This, this is a cardiologist patients. How many steps do you think she discovered that they were taking a day? By the way, it shocked her. About a thousand steps a day. Oh, if people could just get up and move more. In, in one study, healthy older adults took about 6,600 steps per day with almost 3,000 steps coming from a structured plan movement. My dad is 82 and he takes about 7,500 steps a day. And that's good for someone his age to be doing that. And so if you can increase the steps, it'll, there's great benefits to you. Pedometers proved to increase movement also. They had two different groups. One were going to wear a pedometer, and their goal was 10,000 steps a day. Another group was to walk for 30 minutes, a brisk walk for 30 minutes. And they were going to wear a pedometer, but it wasn't a visual one. They couldn't see it. And so what the end result of this was that those who were on the pedometer, they walked over 10,000 steps a day, but those who were just on the 30-minute program ended up walking almost a mile less. Still 8,270 steps, but that's almost a mile less. And so there are benefits with a pedometer. It tells you what your progress is during the day, how many steps that you've got, and what's your goal, where are you in that. Motivation. If you're at a certain level and you want to reach that, that goal, then you'll know how many steps to take in the, you know, in the evening if the weather's nice, they can get out and walk. And it's accurate. And what I use here is the Omron pedometers that are very accurate. And it's more accurate, these steps are more accurate than probably counting your calories there. So any benefits to using the pedometer? Well, it reduced my stress levels. It was very easy to just put on the pedometer and check it during the day. It really works. And my blood pressure is down to normal. My clothes all fit better. Well, what about, now we're talking about this moving. I notice that when I go to a restaurant, I see a lot of the waiters or waitresses, they're up on their feet and they're moving. But I've seen some that are overweight too. Now, what, what's the problem here? Well, it may not be the movement. It may be the fuel that they're giving themselves for the amount of movement. Maybe they're giving themselves too much fuel, that is, food. And that's what we're going to talk about next. So here we go. I'm too busy. My free time is too short. Well, go to the ant. Consider its ways and be wise. And now guess what? It is time for everyone to stand up. Make sure those enzymes do not get in the hibernation mode. Get up and move, and you can get yourself some of that ice water. And we'll get started again in just about five, six, seven, eight minutes.